everybody out there in Zoom land. Um, thank you for inviting the Antelope Valley Conservancy to come and present to you about who we are, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. My name is Wendy Reed. I am one of the founders of the Antelope Valley Conservancy, and I currently serve as the Chief Financial Officer and part-time administrator. Crystal Moore is our administrative assistant and is um, one of the young people whom I have been training and who are taking over the leadership of the Antelope Valley Conservancy. Um, you wanted a short bio. I have a bachelor's in communication with a minor in economics, a master's degree in public administration. Um, I was participating in regional planning, uh, showing up at meetings and speaking my piece. I volunteered at the Resource Conservation District and at the Prime Desert Woodland Preserve Citizens Design Committee, and that is how I stumbled into the formation of the Conservancy as one of the founders. So that gives you a little bit of an idea who we are. We are a volunteer-managed organization, and we rely on volunteers to serve as our board of directors, to serve as officers of our corporation, and uh, we do have a little bit of part-time uh, paid employee personnel. Uh, other than that, we go ahead and we hire contracted professionals like biologists or surveyors, attorneys, very rarely, <laughs> accountants, um, and other professionals, people who do uh, phase one studies and other kinds of professional studies that we're not qualified to do. Although many of our volunteers do have these skill sets of accounting, of law, we've had attorneys, we've had biologists, we've had park managers, we've had Department of Fish and Wildlife biologists. Uh, many people have stepped up and volunteered with us since our founding in 2005. We did found ourselves as a charitable corporation. We are not affiliated with any other charity and we're not affiliated with any government entity. Let me also apologize to those of you in Zoom land that the presentation is not on Zoom. You're not missing much. It's kind of a, an outline, you know, so that I know what I'm supposed to talk about. So that's who we are. What do we do? In our mission statement, the primary work that we do is to acquire and steward lands. We can acquire and steward any kind of lands. They might be historic sites. They might be scenic beauty. We focus on habitat preservation for threatened species, watershed resources, and places that are irreplaceable in the Antelope Valley. Uh, we also have to steward the land in perpetuity. That means forever. <laughs> Sometimes we do that by owning the land. We can hold a conservation easement over the land where it's owned by somebody else. We can collaborate with other entities. For example, the sanitation districts of Los Angeles County had to fulfill preservation of 350 acres for rare plants in Alkali uh, Mariposa Lily. And we were able to bring in uh, the biological expertise to determine which lands they should acquire that would best establish that preserve. We also go ahead and we provide education, consultation, and resources for community engagement. So a lot of people don't understand the way that the desert works and the ecology of the desert. We can come in and explain that. A lot of people don't understand food webs and why wildlife is important to our survival. We can explain that. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand things about fencing that harms our raptors or rodenticides that harm everybody in the food chain. They just don't understand. So we're able to come in to community organizations and educate about those very important issues. Simple things that we can do that help all of us and help our community. Um, we also can provide resources for community engagement in regional planning. For example, the employees of the state park at the Poppy Reserve are prohibited by their employment 
from participating in regional planning. And yet, a racetrack was proposed right next to the poppy reserve. Oh my so we, as an organization, were able to bring a letter of comment together that came from a volunteer at Poppy Reserve, was then refined in language by me, was then refined by biological content by our chief biologist, Richard Montillo, were then gone ahead and, and gone through for the legals by Gary Ma, local attorney, and that was the letter that everybody used when they went to the county and said, don't do this. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. So we also went ahead and we funded a van that could take a dozen of us, 14 of us, down to the Planning Commission hearing in Los Angeles County. And we were there as the attorney was presenting a aerial photo. And he said, as you can see, there's no wildlife corridor through here. <laughs> And we were able to question that, and it was the death of, of the racetrack project. Yeah. So, <laughs> we have nothing against the racetrack, per se, but it was poorly sited, it was in a bad location for fire danger, and all kinds of, of things. What's so those are the Willow kinds Springs? of... What? What's wrong what with Willow Springs? Exactly, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you later <laughs> that this individual who proposed the racetrack had a beef with the people who uh -huh. owned Willow Springs, uh -huh. and that's why he was trying to do this. Yeah, so we already have one. And they have friends in high places, so what can you do, right? But we are the people. Okay, you are what you all attested to in your opening ceremony is that our voice as the people, the government works for us, but it is a participation sport. Okay, we have to participate in it or we won't be heard. The Conservancy gives the community an opportunity to organize. Um, we got over a thousand names signed on a petition for the CECL listing, California Endangered Species Act listing for the Western Joshua Tree. It's one of our recent, recent projects. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we are able to collaborate people together and that's very helpful. So how do we do it? How do we fund ourselves? How do we get, you know, things like this off the ground and how do we have money to work with? Well, first of all, we get acquisition funding from grants and donations. We write grants, we get grants all the way from private foundations and families that have trusts to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the State of California Proposition Funding. And as a 501c3, B1A6, we are entitled to apply for these grants as a corporation in good standing, with good financials and good management. We qualify for these grants and we have been able, for example, we acquired 40 acres of wetlands at the Devil's Punch Bowl for the county parks with uh, the grants that we have. Um, we also get land donations. Um, donations of land are really very important to us. A lot of people in the Antelope Valley have invested in land or um, inherit land from their grandparents or their aunt who thought the railroad was going to go through and everybody's going to be a millionaire. Maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> they have these lands and they donate them to us. Rarely we're able to put those lands into preservation. They're appropriate for conservation. But most of the lands that we receive by donation are not but they are able to be listed for resale and the proceeds of those sales can fund other acquisitions and other projects and work. Ah, uh, mitigation. Mitigation is a complicated progress process, but it is our specialty. We've spent 18 years now learning about it and making the connections for it. And it's the main reason that we decided to form a conservancy. Back when I was involved with Research Conservation District and the Prime Desert Woodland Preserve, and we were watching Joshua Tree woodlands and wildflower fields and everything just be destroyed, one of the equestrians on the east side here came out and she found kit fox corpses where they had bulldozed the, the property with no recourse, no mitigation, no nothing. And it's heartbreaking. 
And so we went to those powers that be at the cities, at the county, at the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they said, well, sometimes we require mitigation, but we can't fulfill it in your area. It goes down to the Santa Monica Mountains and you know pays for equestrian trails for Hugh Hefner's oh. ranch. And we need a conservancy up here. That's why we formed this conservancy. And that's why this conservancy is managed by local people and run by local people. It's harder that way. You know by your organization. But that's what democracy is, and that's how it should be. So we have been able, over many years, uh, since 2007, 2008, we were first authorized by the state to hold mitigation and implement mitigation. What is mitigation? Mitigation in simple terms. Whenever you want to impact your land or build something, you have to go to the powers that be, some jurisdictional agency, and get a permit for the work you're doing. A grading permit, a building permit, a plumbing permit, a dust permit. Some of those permits will take a look at the destruction of biological resources or stream bed resources, and you need to get a permit for that. And there's no way that you can mitigate that on site. So they require, those government entities, require something called off-site compensatory mitigation that compensates all of us and future generations for the loss of burrowing owl territory over here for the preservation of burrowing owl territory over here. And in fact, our first mitigation implementation was for burrowing owl from the high school district that was building a new um, high school in Palmyo and needed mitigation. And that became our Big Rock One Preserve. We have expanded it from 38 acres up to 90 acres. We're looking at another two and a half acres now. It's a slow progress, but it's a beautiful space. We have not only burrowing owl wintering, but desert tortoise breeding, kit foxes breeding, American badgers running through, incredible area, south of Edwards Air Force Base. Um, we spoke a little bit about collaboration with the Sanitation District County Parks um, and about our participation in regional planning and providing information for the community. So that's how we preserve land. But why should we preserve land? A lot of people take a look at the desert, especially people who haven't been here very long or don't get up early in the morning. <laughs> and, they, and they look around and they go, well, this is a dead place. There's nothing here. What on earth are you preserving? But we know better. <laughs> we are important. We're important in a greater ecosystem of migratory birds. We're important to these things. So our mission statement when we founded specifically and explicitly acknowledges the right of nature to retain territory. That nature itself has some inherent God-given right on this planet to retain territory for itself. Mm -hmm. That elephants should have a place to exist, that whales should have oceans in which to exist, and that our desert, our Joshua Tree Woodlands, our creosote lands, People may not think they're very beautiful. We know better. We also acknowledge our descendants' rights, and I like that in your opening thing too, that we, we are responsible to give them an ability to experience nature the way that we have experienced nature. It shouldn't all be about the mall and the phone. <coughs> we do have a role in ecosystem function. It is counterintuitive, but an acre of desert sequesters as much carbon dioxide as an acre of forest. Deserts are very efficient carbon sequestration, and they're also very efficient in cooling. Any kind of open and green spaces can cool the areas by 20 degrees, 40 degrees. They're looking in urban areas now, putting what they call green roofs and planting trees, and we have a real dichotomy between what wealthy economic zip codes have in terms of greenery and, 
and open space and what urban, core, impoverished, and working class people get in their neighborhoods. So the interest of environmental justice and in fairness, <laughs> we really need to preserve things that aren't just out where the wealthy have their mansions up on the mountain, but down in the core of the, of the city. And from a selfish perspective, these things like access to trails, being able to go and walk your dog in open spaces, being able to see scenic beauty around you, it's just good for us. And it's good for our property values. Communities that have green spaces, open spaces, trails, you know, have much higher property values. They generate more taxes. We generate more intergenerational wealth in our homes. You know, so just selfishly, it's, it's an important thing to preserve nature in your community. So it's not only our role in the greater ecosystem, but also the role of nature in our personal lives. Lastly, I want to tell you just very quickly about our current project, because we've done a lot of things in 18 years. It's on our website. You can go and you can look at our history and our story. You go, wow, they did that, they did this, they, oh, I was part of that, oh, that was that. Okay, you can read about us. But what we've done most recently is we are at the Big Rock One Preserve I told you about. We are investigating whether we should install artificial burrowing owl burrows to encourage more nesting in the area. It's complicated. What is the opportunity cost of that? What other species would be imp impacted by that? Is there enough for them to really nest there? Would we be endangering them rather than helping them? Mm -hmm. So we're doing the research with a bunch of different experts. Um, one of our volunteers, Jacob Engel, uh, who did conservation restoration for a couple of years, um, has come back to the Antelope Valley. He has a girlfriend and a mom here and his roots here, and he's heading up that project for us as a volunteer. Um, we also went ahead and we applied for and achieved something called a conceptual area preservation plan. Mm -hmm. And ours is for the rift zone of Palmdale that extends from just east of Lake Palmdale at Una Lake, for those of you who know Una Lake, and extends along that rift zone in that watershed, past Barrel Springs, past Little Rock Wash. Mm -hmm. And for a mile, two miles wide through that entire area, we have a lot of government agency ownership. Little Rock Irrigation District, Palmdale Water District, others, they don't have resources for habitat preservation. That's not really their job. Their job is to provide water for us to drink and maybe to protect us from flooding. So what this conceptual area preservation plan does is it gives any homeowner, any property owner, in the area of the plan to apply to the state for funding, for restoration, for stewardship. Maybe it's for fencing, maybe it's for graffiti removal, maybe it's just to enhance the wetlands better for the kind of birds that are there and using the area. But it gives them resources for work that they otherwise wouldn't have resources for. And our most recent and most wonderful project is we received a $64,000 grant to establish a Joshua Tree Woodland Preserve. And we centered this, you know this area, we're talking 50th East and Palmdale Boulevard, beautiful Joshua Tree Woodlands all in through there, because Joshua Trees just did receive state protection. Nobody wants to buy those lands and develop them because the mitigation is too expensive, which is a wonderful opportunity for us. So with our grant funding, we were able to do the phase one studies and the biological studies, plot all of the different parcels, um, and begin an effort to acquire the lands. We at this point have uh, 12 and a half acres that we're actively working to acquire. And those are our current projects. So I think at this point, the best thing is to open it up to questions. I don't know if people 
on Zoom world can ask questions, but they could ask their chat. Yeah. Laura. Perfect. Laura. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Do you fence the land um, that you own? Put a fence around it, or our policy is not to. Okay. And this was something that we um, learned a real, a real good lesson from the Prime Minister of Land Preserve. Um, <laughs> when we were on the Citizens Preserve Committee, we fought for them to not fence the area. And the fencing has really been a detriment to the wildlife within it. It's, um, you know, a wonderful place for Joshua trees to exist, and birds to fly in and out, but there were kit fox populations, there were other populations that no longer can sustain them because they have no interbreeding. Mm -hmm. And it's really bad. I heard that it was really bad for the coyotes, that, oh, yeah. you know, because they couldn't, yeah. couldn't travel in and out. Plus the fact that a lot of our preserves have wetlands and, and stream bed. How do you fence a stream bed? Yeah. Okay, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. In some areas like Big Rock Wash, people have been using the wash as a road forever, okay, in the mm -hmm. Eastern Valley, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, the damage that it does is pretty minor. Most dirt bikers outgrow it after a couple of years and, you know, go away. Um, mm -hmm. We've had good experience, mm -hmm. too, just talking with them and explaining that this is an area that we're preserving, would they please not ride in here? And then you don't see the trails anymore, and they go around the perimeter on the outside. So really good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got one. Yes. I went many, many years ago to, it was a city meeting about prime desert woodlands. They were trying to acquire the property next door mm -hmm. so that it didn't get developed. And I really haven't been over there. Did anything happen with that? You know, I do believe, because I attended an Audubon chapter meeting, mm -hmm. and they expressed at that point that the developer had gone ahead and given it to them for preservation. Okay. Um, the developer was the same developer that had destroyed Burwing Owl burrows across the valley. You remember that, right. you know? Yeah. So um, I had said something about the lack of mitigation implementation for those destructions, and they hopped right up and said, oh no, we're doing it, we're doing it. So I do believe that that- Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, that that was added into it. I didn't know it. if that had happened. On the east side, right? Yeah. 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 So. Yes, online, um, Cynthia Chambers says, do you buy land for Native Americans to care for as they have done in the past? Well, we have not. Although we do have very good relationships with Native American nations and tribes, um, both personal and as an organization. One of the outreaches that we did for um, promoting that the State Fish and Game Commission should approve California Endangered Species Act protection for the Western Joshua Tree was to reach out to Native American populations and get them to write in to protect the Joshua trees. Um, the Fish and Game Commission holds their opinions very highly. Um, under Deb Hallett as our Secretary of the Interior, I believe our nation has made incredible strides toward returning to Native American practices of stewardship of um, wetlands areas, native plant areas toward the coast, um, salmonic streams, and even forest management. Um, you know, we like, we, white people who came, all of us who descended from, you know, uh, early Americans, um, we like to believe that we know best. And when the Forest Service and the railroad came and took the Western lands from the Native American people, they told the Native Americans, you can't burn anything. Don't burn anything. And then they realized, and this was actually the birth of the American um, a forest service was that the railroad had gone, I think it was like Minnesota or Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, someplace up in that part of the nation, and, um, and there was a, a horrific fire. And that area had never experienced that. It was because they were preventing the Native Americans from doing the stewardship that they always did. Mm -hmm. They were not, you know, 
savages wandering and going, oh, a frog, I think I'll eat that. You know, like, they stewarded all of the land where they traveled from place to place seasonally. They reduced their impact on the land to live in harmony with Earth's ecosystem. And I think that under Deb Helland as Secretary of the Interior, we've made a lot of progress toward that. We have not had the opportunity to do that. Um, we do have a good relationship with the Mountains Recreation Conservation Authority and just donated two acres at Big Rock Wash to them for in perpetuity stewardship. And one of their, um, uh, I believe possibly the chair of their board, correct me if I'm wrong, um, of the Mountains Recreation Conservation Authority is Mr. Ortega, who is the chairman of the Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so that, that's about as far as we've gone right this moment. We would be overjoyed, overjoyed for an opportunity to be able to partner and acquire important lands. Yeah, they just received a 500 acre donation that this year. It was in our newsletter. The Fernanda to Tavius. Fantastic. Yeah. Where? I mean, what um, kind of land? That's our newsletter. <laughs> my brain yes, is maybe like have a copy of, May we please have a copy of your newsletter to yeah, take I have it right here. <laughs> Very it's nice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. It's She's fine. right on it. Okay. Will you pass it back to Crystal? Pass it back that way, and we'll, and we'll get it home. So see. The education with the Animal Valley Conservancy always goes to ways. <laughs> right, that's good. Yes, um, I'd like to know if you know anything about the Barrel Springs area. I live right down the streets from it, and I know they say it used to be a stagecoach stop back in. <coughs> and I think private owners own it now, but I was thinking, you know, the state needs to take it over. So, Mr. Sevilla. Okay, the, the history of the Barrel Springs is exactly. The stagecoach went through there. The springs just bubbled out of the ground. Um, there were Native American trails that came from up by Tahone and across the valley, down by Una Lake, up through the watershed, two barrel springs. They went from water to water, okay? Gee, we're in the desert, I wonder why, okay? Um, it's interesting, as a side note, and I'll segue back, I promise, we were out looking at a piece of land, a, a, a biologist and myself, and I said, oh, there's an awful lot of dirt bike trails around here. I don't think this would be a good land for preservation. He goes, I didn't see any dirt bike trails. I go, well, like this. He goes, that's not a dirt bike trail, that's a rabbit trail. Rabbit trails are then trailed by coyotes and foxes who hunt rabbits. Mm -hmm. And then Native Americans came and followed those trails <laughs> to hunt their animals. And then, when white men came, white men rode his horses down those trails, and then dragged the cart behind the horse, and the trail got wider. Most of the roads, main roads that we have, started as rabbit trails. <laughs> and this is one of the interesting reasons why are major freeways, like the five freeway, go right down through the watershed? And why we have so much trouble with wildlife dispersal and crossing? Because, gee, rabbits used to have trails there. <laughs> we just all kept following because there was a hole in the brush. So, so Barrel Springs is along that pathway of the original trails of the Native Americans who came through. It then became a bit of a settlement. And the, yes, the Pony Express, you know, went through there, Wells Fargo and stuff. Then a rich guy got it and built like a house with a school for his children and all of this. And then it passed to the family of the Seville's. The, the building burned down at some point. Um, and he sold to the aqueduct, which goes right along the very back of the property. And he sold that to the state. And the house had to be done away with. In the Sevilla family, Mr. Sevilla always thought, this is a great place for a mansion. 
And he diverted the water from the springs, and he made pools. He actually, very recently, I mean, recently in geologic terms, maybe 12, 13, 14 years ago at the most, diverted the water that would splash downhill down the watershed into the Bear Springs area. And there were incredible grasslands through there. You would hear the, um, the frogs. The yeah, yeah. Frog. everywhere. Pacific tree frogs, I think they're called. Um, and by diverting that water and sending it down the hill on the north side, not only did he flood out somebody's equestrian arena, but he also really changed the whole character of, of that wetlands watershed. Bless his heart, Mr. Seville passed, and his family inherited the property. And his daughter, Carol Seville, really wanted to put it into conservation. Unfortunately, they had a lot of money invested in it, and so they had to charge a lot of money for it. We still basically reached a deal, and then the California budget crisis happened, and they froze our grant funds. Mm -hmm. And so our options to purchase expired. There's really nothing we could do. So close, and yet so far. And um, only recently, Carol did sell it. I haven't been up there. Yeah. Sometimes you don't want to go back. Yeah. And, and we have it all, we gave it all. Yeah. We have to take our dogs up there and they go swimming in the pond and you know, and there's fish in there. And, yeah, it was, and that dog gave it off. And I think they sold it for like 12 or 17 million dollars, something like that. I think it was their dad. Yeah, it you, can't, you can't preserve everything, okay? You have to fight the good fight and do the good work and have the successes that you have and not let the failures get you down. Maybe one day. More questions? Are there any more questions? Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. We do have some handouts in the back. Mm -hmm. These are tracks and trails information. Um, they're very appropriate for children to learn about how to go walking in the desert, what to do, how to keep field notes. We also have some buttons for sale. So please visit our website, give us a phone call, think of us when you have land that you want to donate, and please get involved. We have meetings four times a year by Google Meet. Uh, they last about an hour and a half. It's a very small commitment. And then by attending those meetings, you may decide that there's something that you want to get involved and do more, but just attending the meetings and learning what we do and how we operate is incredibly valuable to That's us. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you again. We have a certificate for you from Antelope Valley Chapter. We appreciate you coming out. We like, to. We like photos. <laughs>